hello everyone uh, let's get started so in the last uh, lecture we have seen the fundamentals of solar cells we have analyzed the operation and we identified a, a few key parameters that are essential for uh, optimizing the efficiency of uh, a solar cell so today uh, we will turn our attention to another class of uh, opto electronic devices namely photo detectors so if you uh, look at you know our daily life the most common photo detector that all of us are aware is a human eye so it is sensitive to light right so it turns out that human eye is sensitive to the visible part of the spectrum the visible part of the spectrum will lie in the wavelengths 300 nanometers to 700 nanometers so that is what i am showing here so if i draw a line here let's say here so this is about 700 nanometers and on the lower wavelength range it is about 300 nanometers so the axes are actually showing you both energy and wavelength so it's increasing in energy and increasing in wavelength this way so you see that human eye if you look at the relative response of the eye it is having a peak in the visible spectrum so it is ranging from about uh, the blue region or you know which is about 350 nanometers to the red which is about 700 nanometers so this is the visible part of the spectrum and you can see that it has a peak at let's say green in the green region of the spectrum it is very very uh, efficient so small signal in the green spectrum can actually be detected by the human eye very very efficiently so uh, if you think about it human eye is a very very versatile uh, system so we can actually look at the sun directly and you know the uh, the pupils will contract and you are still able to detect, even if you have a large amount of light we are able to detect or you go into a dark room you switch off all the light sources after some time your eye adjusts and you can actually see even i mean even if there is some faint light we will be able to see right uh, in fact recently there were some scientific experiments that were done and it was shown that a human eye is capable of detecting even a single photon with a uh, significant statistical uh, probability you know about chance it's you know so we can actually detect a single photon if you think about it that's a very very amazing thing because if you uh, just think about a regular laser pointer that we use in our presentations right this uh, small battery operated laser pointer if you shine that typically the power that is emitted by that is about few milliwatts okay and you have seen that and if you hit that you know if you shine that light you will see that it's bright and you can follow the presentations right so in that spot there are about 10 power 15 photons and we are able to see it quite clearly now you start reducing the number of photons by 15 orders of magnitude and we still can see with the human eye it, it's a very very fantastic uh, uh, piece of you know of, of, of a fantastic photo detector in that sense so uh, in some sense we would like if our ideal photo detector has to emulate the response of human eye but is that sufficient for us well it turns out that it is not enough because human eye for all its versatility it is still limited for example you cannot see very well in the dark i mean single photon level it can detect but you need to have you know it takes a long long time to detect that for example you know uh, in the army or you know in the counter intelligence uh, insurgency operations soldiers want to have night vision goggles right you might have seen that they wear these goggles which can actually show them in the, uh, show the images in the night how are they operating well it turns out that uh if you if you take a human body we have a temperature of about 38 degrees centigrade so that translates to about uh, 308 kelvin right so for that particular temperature all of us are continuously emitting ir radiation so we emit a radiation in the peak about about 10 microns approximately okay so all of us are emitting this ir radiation and if you build a photo detector that can actually measure this ir radiation 10 microns then we can actually see in the dark and this is a technology that we use you know in the, in the for the night vision we use a technology which is called as uh, long wavelength ir lwir it's called so we have lwir detectors which can enable us to actually see what is there in the dark so this is what soldiers use in the field so these are also some sort of semiconducting materials okay we will talk about it later on uh, another application could be that you know uh, there are a lot of industrial processes that have temperatures in the range of 1000 to 1500 kelvin so you heat up you know for example let's say oxidation we want to heat it up 900 kelvin, uh, kelvin. 
900 centigrade actually okay or you know there is melting of steel and things like that where you have 1000 1500 degrees uh, kelvin so if you have such temperatures how do you measure that well you know you can't put a thermometer and measure the temperature because the moment you put a thermometer it is going to melt right so for those ranges also for example if you have 1500 kelvin uh, again we have seen the black body radiation right so we said that if you have a object that is heated up to about 600 uh, 6000 kelvin that will have a peak in the visible right if you have a lower amount of heat for example 1500 kelvin its peak radiation would be about you know in the range somewhere between 2 to 3 micrometers so if you are able to build a detector photo detector that can detect 2 to 3 micrometer radiation then it can be used in the industrial applications right i mean another common example you might see is in you know, automatic door openers right they operate in the near infrared so whenever you go near a object it has a ir and then that ir will be detected and okay the the detector detects that there's a person and it opens the door right so these are all different applications of a photo detector and so today we would like to understand the basic principles of these photo detectors so to start with let us look at you know the, one of the simple photo detectors which is namely a photo conductive detector what it does is you take a piece of silicon or any semiconductor for the pattern silicon is the most common one so you take a piece of silicon and you shine light on it what happens well it you know the light produces electron hole pairs this is a story we have been telling many many times during this course so what happens if you produce an electro, electron hole pairs well you can actually detect the change in the conductivity of that piece of silicon so for example if i shine right here i am showing an image of a semiconductor and you have some light incident on it sorry uh, there is some light incident on this and we are applying a certain voltage to the semiconductor so this is a bar of semiconductor of an area l and length l okay so uh, if you apply current uh, voltage there will be some current we have already seen this this is the drift current that flows in the semiconductor so the drift current current i can write it as you know sigma times e which is you know the ohms law this sigma would be uh, we have seen it multiple times so q times uh, mobility of the carriers times the concentration of the carriers let's say there is n not of uh, electrons there mobility is mu n times charge plus q mu p p not so these are the equilibrium concentration of the semiconductor there will be some you will see some current that flows in the semiconductor now when you shine light you are going to produce additional electron hole pairs and they are also going to cause uh, current uh, sorry yeah current so how many electron hole pairs are produced well that depends on you know uh, how much light you are shining let's say you know there are equal you know amount of uh, electrons and hole pairs so let's say we'll assume uh, this is a n type semiconductor assume n type semiconductor so if i assume that and you shine light let's say the minority carriers will be basically the poles the excess minority carriers will be proportional to the generation rate times the the minority carrier lifetime right tau p so this is the number of holes that are produced in this case and of course this will be equal to delta n which is the number of electrons and after some time they are going to recombine right so because of this excess minority carriers what is the conduction that is achieved well that turns out to be if I, i can write it here so this you know since uh, delta n and delta p are equal i'll just mention only delta p so this will be q uh, delta p times mobility of n times plus mobility of p so this is the mob- uh, conductivity for excess conductivity right so this is what is uh, produced in a uh, semiconductor so what we can do is we can detect this light induced current and what will this light induced current be well you have you know i have separated out the D, uh, the dc or you know the background current and the light induced current so the light induced current jl will be equal to q times delta p times mu n plus mu p times electric field and this delta p of course is equal to gl times uh, generation times tau p times mu n plus mu p times electric field okay so uh, since we know the semiconductor physics we can actually think about it you know qualitatively what should happen when will this detector be good okay one of the conditions is that the length of the detector must be small the reason for that is if you have a large length let's say you know 500 microns length 
what happens to the generated electron hole pairs? We know that they will quickly recombine, right? So we don't want that recombination to happen. Before they can recombine, we want the current to actually flow into the external circuit. So for this, we have to, for a photoconductive detector to work efficiently, we need to make sure that the length of the photo detector L is you know, reasonable, you know, it's, it's not very large, okay? L is not very large, not very large. The reason is, if it's large, it's going to, uh, I mean, it's going to, uh, the minority carriers are going to recombine. For example, in the center of the uh, silicon, you generate these electron hole pairs, but they will recombine before they reach the terminals. We don't like that, okay? So the L should not be large. There's another reason why L should not be large. That is, we are having the electric field here, E. So electric field will simply be the voltage dependent, uh, divided by the, the length, right? So for example, if I say, uh, apply electric uh, voltage of one volt, and I take my detector length to be, let's say 100 microns, just as an example, 100 microns will be how much? It will be 10 power minus four centimeter. So how much will this be? Uh, one as of 10 power minus two goes. So basically 10 power two volts per centimeter. And we have already seen when studying drift current that 10 power two is not really a large amount of electric field. You know? We saw that in the PN junctions, the field is about 10 power four volts per centimeter. So this is not a large field. So if you want to increase the field strength, you have to uh, reduce the size of the detector. Maybe choose 10 microns or even one micron. Okay, so that is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that if you choose a very, very thin detector, first of all, it's mechanically difficult to fabricate. Even if you manage that, the problem would be you need to have significant amount of light absorption, right? And light absorption is going to be proportional to the length of the detector. You can't have a very, very small detector and expect to produce a lot of electron hole pairs, right? So uh, that also comes into picture. So the overall uh, performance of the detector will be you know, uh, dependent on these parameters. Let us take some simple examples and try to estimate how much is the current that is produced by such a photo detector? Let's say, you know, we, we know generation rate, right? Let's assume the generation rate to be, let's say, you know, 10 power 20, okay? Centi per centimeter cube per second. This is the rate that I'm assuming, okay? So how many photons will it give per centimeter? Uh, you know, in this case, how many, what is the photon flux? The photon flux, with the amount of photons that are produced, uh, photons are rather the number of uh, number of uh, minority carriers that are produced is going to be G times tau. Tau p will be typically about uh, you know in the semiconductors it will be, in silicon it will be 10, 10 microseconds maybe that's typical number for uh, indirect band gap semiconductors. So we can compute you know. So let's say here if you try to directly estimate J, JL is going to be I'll just do an order of magnitude estimation, 10 power minus 19 Q, and this is 10 power 21. Tau P will be 10 power minus 6. Mobility, mobility is, you know, for N type it is 10 power, uh, sorry, 1350. And for P type it is 400. I'll say again, you know, I'll just roughly put 10 power 3,000. Okay. And electric field, let's say I managed to make 10 micron thickness of the semiconductor. So I'll make 10 power 3. So what will be the order of magnitude of this guy? So three plus three, uh, six, six will go out here. So essentially you have uh, 10 power two. Right, amps per centimeter square. Okay. Well, this is, this is kind of, you know, uh, the range that you'll expect, okay. What you need to realize is this is much more significant. Of course, if you design this optimally, choose the lens to be small and you have a large number of uh, uh, large amount of light incident, then you can get large currents. This is much, much stronger than the reverse saturation current that you'd have seen in the uh, PN junctions. All right. So what do we need to make sure that, you know, there's a good photoconductive detector? Well, for a good photoconductive detector, You need small thickness. This is one of the requirements. And you need uh, large tau p. Okay. So 
if you have small thickness basically the kind of the current that you produce j is proportional to tau p because if you have larger minority carrier lifetime it will stay longer the recombination will not happen so they will actually go into the terminals and then it's inversely proportional to the uh, length if you have a small length then actually you will get large current okay so both of these things so this is the typical expression that you can have okay. so this is photoconductive detectors but you know these are you know these are good but it's very difficult to design some of this and some for some like applications we use we like them we like, we actually for high speed applications we like photoconductive detectors but uh, we have another mechanism that we can use to uh, to build photo detectors now for example here if you make the thickness very small you are not generating sufficient number of electron hole pairs because the thickness is small the absorption of photons will be small and so electron hole pairs will be small sometimes we might want to actually generate larger number of electron hole pairs so how can we do that okay, we don't have that much of control so what we do is we extend this we actually build it instead of a simple piece of silicon we can build a detector out of a pn junction and those detectors are called as photovoltaic detectors you know for example i can take a pn junction we have already studied this in great detail let's say i take a pn junction well i don't like the shape yeah so if you take a pn junction and you know so i want to refer to this diagram so i'll basically write it in the same way so i'll take n and p here so i'll have positive charges here and negative charges i just reverse the polarity that we have typically taken so because i want to be consistent with the diagram on the left so i can apply a reverse bias to this when i apply a reverse bias i can control my uh, depletion width and i can increase my depletion width okay so what happens in this case well you will see that there is you know a strong electric field in the positive x direction right so now if you don't do anything you know just apply this voltage and wait what happens well we have uh, we have studied you know the reverse bias operation of a junction so what happens is let's say this is x equal to 0 is the edge of the n region and x, this is the edge of the p region so you have the depletion region but uh, and okay let's say this is a p type on the right so this should be the equilibrium concentration of electrons which i can write it as uh, n p n p not let's say equilibrium concentration of electrons in the p region and you can have uh, in the n region you'll have minority carriers p n not right and we have seen that closer to the edge of the depletion region the minority carrier concentration reduces that is because there's an electric field which will sweep the holes to the right and electrons to the left causing the you know uh, over a certain diffusion length we saw that the minority carrier concentration will reduce so this is what happens when you, you know have simply have uh, no uh, light present you know just you know a pn junction so there's amount of uh, you know no light let's say no light Uh, implies you know, we call it there is certain current which flows which is called as j dark okay, dark current we say okay without any light so this will be roughly equal to the j saturation saturation okay if you don't apply any voltage or you know small voltage don't go to the breakdown okay then essentially yes it will be roughly flat right we have seen the pn junction side characteristic so that will be the dark current in a photo detector now if you shine light what happens well if you shine light you're going to introduce minority carriers and how many minority carriers are you going to introduce well in this region you're going to introduce uh, the light whatever you know generation rate times the the minority carrier lifetime which is tau n and on the left you're going to introduce generation rate times the minority carrier lifetime again but because of the electric field present these carriers are again driven away right the electrons will be sorry the holes will be driven in this direction the electrons will be driven in this direction so uh, yeah yeah minority carriers are electrons here so electrons will be driven in this direction that's why the minority carrier the electron current is in this direction and similarly the hole current is in this direction right so current flows in the plus x direction so that is what we are showing here okay and the total amount of current for this detector it turns out that it will be this expression here in the bottom we are not deriving it i don't think we need to derive it so the current is going to be 
equal to the generation rate. This is generation rate. Okay, this will be the units of uh, per centimeter cube. Okay, per second of course, right? And this is length. You know, this will be centimeter, right? And so this is charge. That's why you get this to be in the amps per centimeter square. Okay, so this is how I can I remember you usually. Okay, so what you see is you need uh, your the current that you are producing in such a scenario is dependent on the width of the depletion region. Of course, this is the depletion width. Okay, and the minority carrier diffusion length and the majority carrier diffusion length. Rather, no minority carrier diffusion length in the Sorry, I shouldn't say majority carrier. It's both minority carrier diffusion lengths, but this L P is for the n-type region. L n is for the p-type region. Okay, these are both minority carrier diffusion lengths. Okay. This is for p-type region minority diffusion length. Okay, n is the minority carrier, and that, and here it is for the n-type region. Okay, so now what will this current be typically? Well. We know some estimates, right? We know that W, let's say, is also order of one micrometer. Okay, LN and LP, are, you know, LN comma LP are typically in the range of tens of micrometers for silicon. Okay, so if you take a similar situation as last time, whatever we are taking generation rate to be 10 power 20, the JL turns out to be equal to this is 10 power minus 19 times. I'll take it tens tens of micrometers. So 10 into 10 power minus 4 centimeters into 10 power 20. Okay. So this is roughly what you will see. Oh well, there should also be time. I know this is directly the generation rate, but of course there is going to be some absorption coefficient. Okay. That we will anyway discuss later on. Okay. So you can estimate how much the current is going to be. This is going to be roughly 10 power minus 3 milliamps or something like that. You know, roughly about milliamps per centimeter square okay but the the beauty is that because you have a large depletion now i can increase my reverse bias if i increase my reverse bias i'm going to extend my depletion region and thereby collect more photons the absorption you know we have not accounted for absorption in the photoconductive case we said that you know we implicitly assume that all the photons are absorbed in that region which is not going to be true but if, you, if the thickness is small then it might be valid but in the case of photovoltaic uh, devices, you can adjust the depletion width and thereby increase the uh, number of photons absorbed. Okay. So that is how we are going to use this. So this is a simple photovoltaic device. And by the way, I mean, this expression is an estimate because you know there are certain assumptions so that I've made. We will discuss that later. Uh, this is a rough estimate. Okay, It's not like a very perfect uh, number. All right. So if you have such a scenario, what will be the current? Okay, let's try to uh, take an example problem here. So this is again from the textbook. So you can go back and look at uh, 14.5 of Neven. So calculate the steady, uh, steady state photo current density in the reverse bias long PN junction. Okay, that's a kind of a assumption we are making implicitly. We are saying that the length of the photo detector is uh, greater than, or much much greater than ln LP and so on. Okay. So we want it to be long so that you know uh, the minority carriers uh, it's the minority carrier diffusion length is smaller than the length of the detector. Okay. And you are given some parameters and you are asked to calculate. Well, what do we have to do? We have seen the expression was you know in this case photovoltaic device, right? So PN junction. So yeah, JL is equal to Q times W plus LN plus LP uh, times generation rate. Okay, this is all we have to calculate. So, how do you calculate the width? Well, we know the width of the uh, width of the junction, right? For a PN junction, uh, in the PN junctions we have done, so two epsilon silicon by Q N A N D divided by N A plus N D times uh, voltage, built-in voltage. In this case, we are reverse biasing, so let's say some reverse bias. Okay. So, this is the width of the junction. All right. Well, uh, is this expression correct? How do we analyze this? So I always get confused whether NA plus ND should go on the top or in the bottom. Okay. 
So if it goes in the bottom like this, will this be correct? Well, the way to check that would be, let's assume that you know NA is much, much greater than ND. Okay. So what should determine your width of the minority carrier? Uh, uh, how, okay, if you do this scenario, what will happen? So if you do this, your width will be proportional to root of NA is much greater, so NA will cancel out ND. Okay, so what we are saying is, if P type is heavily doped, uh, N type is going to determine your width, and as you increase the width of the uh, sorry doping concentration of the N region, your width is going to increase. And clearly, this is wrong, right? This is wrong. This should not happen because we saw that as you increase the doping of the N type, the width of the depletion region should reduce. Right? That's our basic understanding of PN junctions. So this expression is wrong. I should correct it. So I mean. So you see, you don't have to remember these expressions. You know? By Q, this should be Na plus Nd divided by Na Nd times Vbi plus Vr. Okay. So if you substitute, I mean, we have done it, you know, many many times. So this will be in the range of one micrometers, let's say. Okay. So I leave you to estimate how. I mean, we have done this indirectly. Well, yeah, this is what the current is going to be. One significant point that I want to make is if you compare this to the reverse saturation current, remember uh, JS, right? This was reverse saturation current in a diode and that was proportional to the, the minority carrier uh, concentration. So Q, I think there was a DN and NP0 divided by, I think it was L, LN, Plus, please verify this formula, dp pn <coughs> excuse me, pn naught divided by lp. Okay. So here, you saw that this was typically in the range of 10 power minus uh, 12 amps per centimeter square. So uh, this was uh, picoamps kind of current, whereas you see that if you have light induced current, you have about milliamps or even hundreds of microamps or even higher. Okay. So these are very, very efficient uh, uh, detectors. Okay. All right. So we saw that if, if you use a simple photo detector, there is not much of flexibility. We had too many constraints. So to overcome those constraints, we have went to PN junctions. We have gone to PN junctions, wherein you can control the width of the depletion region. But what is the typical range over which you can control the width of the depletion region? It's not really that much. Okay. Again, because uh, it can go from about, you know, we saw 0.1 micron to about 1 micron, maybe 1.5 microns with, you know, large voltage. Basically, the width is going to be proportional always to the square root of voltage. If you don't have any voltage, typically about, you know, 0.1 micron, even if you increase the voltage, you're not going to get, get that much of benefit, all right? We still want to increase it further. And the way we achieve that, is actually by using another type of photo detectors, which are called as avalanche photo detectors. Okay, so I, I'll talk about that in the next video. Since it's already 30 minutes, I would like to stop the video here, and I'll record another video where I'll talk about the avalanche photo detectors and also uh, the various metrics that we can use to analyze uh, the photo detectors. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye.